Yeah, thank you, team. Well, hey, good morning. Uh, and, and greetings if I didn't do it already to any of you who may be a guest of Gospel Hope. If you're a first-time guest at Gospel Hope, just kind of slip your hand up. I promise not to make you stand and give any demographic information about yourself. Uh, but just allow us to just show you some love. If you're, uh, if you're new to Gospel Hope, if this is your first time visiting with us. Hey, man, I see you there. Praise God for you. And glad to have you. Um, well, we are continuing in our series uh, entitled Courageous Faith. And uh, uh, as I told the previous service, I will not be your tour guide this morning. We have the honor of uh, actually uh, having someone else who is a great friend of the ministry, Pastor Marty Heron. I don't know if many of you remember him. Uh, he shared with us uh, several months ago uh, when we were um, still worshiping on the uh, other side. And uh, not only a friend of the ministry, but also a family to some uh, because uh, Pastor Marty Heron is uh, the husband of Tammy. You got one wife, right? Right? Uh, that's how it, how it works. But you have four children. And uh, one of those four children is Megan Pena. Uh, so you all know Megan? Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, so 15 grandchildren and uh, almost 45 years of service and ministry. And so just a, a wealth of ministry, wisdom, and knowledge. And we are excited to um, have him actually kind of row with us in the series. And so he's going to pick up where we left off last week. And I'm just excited to have him to take the stage, brother. I appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to, to them being blessed in the same way I was in the previous service. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I am uh, only the husband of one wife. He's exactly right. I married out of my league. My children are out of this world. My grandchildren are out of the universe, and they're awesome. So I have 15 reasons of having therapy, and there are five therapy sessions right here in Atlanta area with uh, Brooke Hava, Jordan, and... Um, I got all the nicknames for them, and Daisy, which is my, the youngest one, and Rafa. So thank you. Privileged to be here. And um, uh, I thought about you, actually. <clears throat> what time do I need to finish? Give me the hard stop. 5 to 12? <laughs> yeah, right. No, I'm, I don't have any evangelism in my blood. So, okay. Um, well, th first of all, uh, thank you for the privilege to speak to you, Okay. Uh, we're talking about courageous faith, and, um, and my hat's off to your church, churches, uh, that next week uh, you have the opportunity to uh, uh, vote on, on uh, meeting together. And it's a challenge, quite honestly. I was talking to somebody a week ago uh, that has a couple different ministries, and I told them very briefly um, that this summer... I, I was with a friend, and he said, you know, I, I was on a flight coming from uh, um, L.A. to Atlanta. And I, I sat on this plane, full plane, one seat open next to me in business. We waited 20 minutes for this lady to get on the plane. I, we didn't know who it was. This lady got on, 50-some-odd, very sharp, professional. And uh, the door closed, and we taxied, and she sat right next to me. And before we took off, I said to her, you know, ma'am, you must be a somebody to have a plane held for 20 minutes for you. He said, what do you do? She said, well, I actually in the United States. I represent the United States in negotiations when other countries break their treaties or contracts with us. So he got, on a, got up in the air, and um, in the midst of this, he said, you know, in the flight coming back to L.A., he said, I, uh, to uh, Atlanta, I, I don't want to bother you, but can I ask you a question? What do you use as a general principle in your negotiations? Because I'm a Christian businessman, and I negotiate contracts with uh, employees, et cetera. She said, well, what I try and do is I try and help both countries uh, suspend their certainties long enough in order to find another possibility. And this, this country is certain they're right. This country is certain they're right. And they have to both be able to suspend that certainty long enough to say, is there another possibility that we negotiate peace between these countries? And in this conversation with my friend who was on this flight who was telling me this, I said, you know, I was in a co multiple conversations with ministries in which, in essence, a gap grows in a, in a relationship. And that gap grows 
often with disagreements or misunderstandings, and they're trying to negotiate. And often what happens is we fill this gap that grows between two people, two families, ministries. This case it was a ministry I was talking to. And we fulfill it with, we, we fill it with suspicion. Rather than, as Proverbs 16 says, a whisper separates chief friends. But love covers a multitude. And so we, rather than fill it with suspicion, have to fill it with trust or love. And that gap starts closing because what happens is change happens. And on one side, that change means uh, growth. But the other side, it means compromise. And how do you end up finding that? This is why in Romans 15, 4, the Apostle Paul to a church in Rome who he had never been to made a powerful statement when he said, the God of patience and consolations, this version says, that he himself is the one that wants you and granting you to be like-minded. Literally, the word is you don't have to think alike, but you do have to think together. And when you think together, he says the God of patience and consolation is the same terms that he says in verse 4. Listen, whatever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, the instruction in doctrine. The scriptures to Paul was the Old Testament. He's a rabbi. He didn't just know the scriptures. He had memorized the Bible as he knew it. And he said, that God of patience and consolation, literally the terms is cheerful endurance and comforting encouragement. He's the God of that. He wants you to have that. Where do you get that? Listen, the learning of Scripture. So he refers to Old Testament stories about people that were going to be forced into stepping out by faith. They were forced into being uncomfortable. They were forced into change and transition into change. And if you can understand that, then you're going to understand the passage in Joshua chapter 3 and 4. So if you have your Bibles, turn there. Because this is a narrative, a historical narrative about an event that Paul had used. Although he didn't reference this specific, but he has referenced a crossing. And I want to talk about this. And maybe as you're turning, um, I can give you uh, an illustration maybe of our own country. Uh, uh, and that might help you in relationship um, uh, to this context. So my wife and I had the privilege to live with almost 20 years in the north woods of Wisconsin, 80 miles above Green Bay. Yeah, yeah, it's really cold up there. And then the next almost 20 years, we ministered in a place called Guam, Harvest Baptist Church. So icebox, oven. And so now for the last five years, we've lived in Iowa. That's kind of like a refrigerator, okay? So, uh, uh, so, so in the midst of the, the Guam years, about four years into it, they, a, a man at a church, Lee, said, would you like to go to Iwo Jima for the day? We're flying up to Iwo Jima. It's an hour flight to Iwo Jima. It's one of the islands among many islands where the Japanese, that was like the front door to Japan. They looked at America as you worship God, the land of the home and free, the land, home of the land and free. That's it. And for J the Japanese, this was a land of God. That's how they saw it. A couple of books, Fly Boys, another book called Flag of Our Fathers by James Bradley. And I'd read both of those. So our opportunity now to go to Iwo Jima, and I flew up with Lee, there was a couple hundred vets, people in their 80s that had fought in Iwo Jima. No, I was not alive back then. Amazing trip. Uh, lots of different stories could be told, actually. But James Bradley happened to be on that trip. He was finding the exact location of the flag. One of the five men was his dad. So he documented the historical event of raising the flag of Iwo Jima. Had the opportunity to talk with him. At the end of the day, there was a man and his wife on the front row in the passport offices before we left. 
And this was a guy that was a Marine, 5'8", five, 5'9", five, real stocky guy. He was in his late 70s. He and all the rest of these guys had fought back in their late teens and early 20s. He was representative of the kind of people that, that just wanted to be a warrior and be a soldier. Fact is, I went up to him and I said, Mr. Lucas, thank you for your service. I've seen you all day long with all these young Marines around your feet, you telling a story. I've heard your story. I read it in Flag of Our Fathers. I said, is it true? He immediately broke out into this whole story. At 14, the, per, the, the Pacific War breaks out, and he says to his mother, I want to be a, a soldier. She said, son, you're 14 years old. You can't, even, you can't even get into your 16. Please lie for me, mom. I so want to be a soldier. So she said, I'll do it if you promise come back and do high school. And he, and he said, I promise. 14, he went into the military. 16, two years later, he's been for two years training as a soldier in Hawaii, and he steals way on a ship headed to Iwo Jima. He lands on Iwo Jima with a number of other Marines, slogs his way up through the sands of Iwo Jima. He's telling me this as we're going by the sands of Iwo Jima. Now we're here, and he's telling me this story. He said, I landed in a foxhole to get away from all the bullets. Two other Marines showed up. We were together fighting, and a hand grenade landed in our foxhole. And then another hand grenade. I pulled them under my body. He said, they both exploded. The force of the blast went down into the sand, which probably saved my life. I had 200 holes in my body. They dragged me off onto the ship back and to Guam, and for two months I'm recovering, and then I'm standing now. They fly me to Washington, and I'm standing in front of the President of the United States getting a Congressional Medal of Honor. Amazing. I'm the youngest man to receive the Congressional Medal of Honor. You can look it up later. And I said, Mr. Lucas, thank you for your service. And if you can understand the passion and force of a young man that now is 16, so wanting to fight, you will understand the dynamic of, of fighting on the front doorstep to Japan. There was fear, and yet there was motivation and courage. You can understand similarly with a group of people that actually had not also fought. They were a bunch of wanderers in a wilderness. Their, their parents had all died over the previous 40 years. Moses was the leader. He was the man that had led them across the Red Sea and holding the staff, and all went apart, and they went through, and then all the Egyptians were destroyed. They were amazed. Forty years later, they're wandering through the wilderness. Now that whole generation had passed off the scene, and now it's Joshua. Moses is dead, end of Deuteronomy. Joshua now is leading the people the warrior into a new land, but they've got to cross the Jordan River. What happened? And Joshua now records three, really what I would call stages that takes us through Joshua chapter three and four, because they had been wanderers, now they're warriors. And they were on the process now of, of a seven years of amazing victories, 31 victories, one defeat. What was the defeat? AI, because they didn't do what they had done for the rest of them. In fact, as this one author, I thought wisely noted, seven years they were virtually untouchable. Seven nations conquered, 31 kings defeated, approximately 10,000 square miles of choice property. Seven years of unbridled success. They were outnumbered, but not outpowered, under-equipped but not overwhelmed. They were the unlikely but unquestionable conquerors of some of the most barbaric armies in history. Had the campaign been a prize fight, the referee would have called it in the first round. And here's Joshua now, 90 years old. For the next seven years, he's the leader. He lives to 110. So what happened? And maybe we can take some life lessons, some inverted truth 
that these become pictures for us. This isn't a type necessarily a shadow. That's a document in the New Testament of specific events. But I think that we can learn some lessons. What are those? If you're taking notes, number one, I would encourage you to jot down. You find the preparation that precedes the journey. These are steps to a victorious Christian walk. Number one, there's preparation. Notice, let's just, let me just read verse um, uh, 1 through 8. I, I've explained most of what you're reading in here. And then let's make some comments. I'll give you two and three. And then I'll close uh, with what I would call take-home truths, things I want you to take home with you. Notice Joshua 1. And this is, by the way, what, jo- uh, what Pastor Rod preached on on on, for, on, on chapter 1 and chapter 2, amazing stories. As, as he made the statement last week, if you were here, they were walking out what God had worked in. I couldn't help but think in Philippians 2, 13, what you had, he had worked in them. They were to work out like a math problem or like mining deep and bringing out what God has done in your life. And these are physical pictures and people who did it. Verse 1, And Joshua rose early in the morning, and he removed from Shittim and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and he lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days, the officers went through the host. They're probably a few miles now from the Jordan River. And these officers went through, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, the priests of the Levites bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. And there will be a space between you and about 2,000 cubits by measure. Don't come near into it, that you may know the way by which you must go. Key phrase, you have not passed this way before. Joshua then said to the people, Sanctify yourselves. Because tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Joshua spake unto the priests and said, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, pass over into the people. And they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, I'll be with you. And thou shalt command them, priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, when you come to the brink of the water of Jordan, you'll stand still in Jordan. And Joshua said to the children of Israel, come hither, hear the words of the Lord your God. What is he telling us? He's telling us, first of all, you've got to prepare. These people had to prepare. They had to understand that for three days, they're thinking about this. They were told what to do. They knew, verse 3, that they commanded the people, the Ark of the Covenant is going to go up before you. The soldiers aren't going to go before us. The priests are going to take the Ark. This Ark represented the very presence of God. There were two long poles, and the priests in the front and the back, and between that, suspended was the Ark. 27 inches by 27 inches by 45 inches covered in gold. The very top of that was pure solid gold, heavy. And on that, I think I might have had a picture of of gold angels. And between the wings was the very presence of God, unlike Indiana Jones of its day in which the ark was lifted up and everybody burned up. That wasn't true. It actually, the presence of God wasn't in it. It was above it, hovering. In there, the ark, they knew Aaron's rod was in there, the 10 tablets or two tablets and 10 uh, uh, laws that were written by the finger of God, not your teacher or your mother, the finger of God and a jar of manna, angel food, white like coriander, which within days of this was all going to go away because for 40 years, for 40 years they ate this. They were coming into the land of promise. This was a land of promise in which it was promised back to their descendant, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. This was... What you you hear singing by Squire Parsons, Beulah Land. To them, it was Beulah Land. This is not a picture, by the way, of heaven. 
because your heaven and my heaven are not going to have battles. I'm not sure I would go so far to suggest to you that Egypt is a picture of, of the unsaved and you cross over the, the, the Red Sea into wandering of a carnal life and eventually you cross over into a victorious Christian life. Maybe there's something to that. But understand that for these people, they had to sanctify themselves. Do you see it? For them, that means I've got to thoroughly wash my body. I have to end up washing all of my clothes, and I'm sanctified. I'm taking time to focus on who God is. And he does say, verse 4, you hang out 2,000 cubits. Say, what in the world is that? Because I don't do cubits either. It's 1,000 yards. It's 10 football fields. I'm thinking football because tonight there happens to be a big, big game. $15 billion spent on tonight's game. I want to put a commercial in. It's going to cost me just under $7 million. bucks. But there's anywhere between 15 to 50 million people watching this. Lots of preparation. If you can think of that, you can think of this preparation. And why was that the case? One is you got two million people and they need to be farther out so they could see where that ark was going. And number two is deep respect for the holiness of God. In the midst of this, you end up finding these people needing to prepare because nobody had gone that way before. They knew and heard about all of that in the land of promise, bad people. They were fearful about their future. But you also end up finding that in verse 6 and 7, as the ark went now from behind them and went before them, verse 6, that the Lord said to Joshua, I'm going to magnify you in the sight of all Israel. I'm going to elevate you as a leader so people would want to lead be followed you as the leader because I will be with you like I was with Moses. And he says it again in verse 10. So there is a pause in which for them they needed to prepare to go in to their land. Number two, you also find it well documented for the rest of this chapter about the passage of the Jordan or really very simply what I put down as the promises to go with them. And what I mean by that is because God promised. It wasn't just his presence. Notice verse 10, Joshua said, Hereby you will know that the living God is among you. The living God, not the dead God that they were going to conquer, these people. And he mentioned seven of them, Canaanites, Hittites, Girgashites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, Jebusites, and a bunch of other what I call it, Ikes, like is yikes, seven of them. You say, this is like a battle in which they win and these people die. But for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, God had been warning them, listen, judgment is coming. And this is why you and I need to understand that our American mindset is like, this is just not fair. This is proof that how could God be God of love? The reality is God is love, and he offered them continual salvation. I'm surprised he didn't do something earlier. And these now wanderers becoming warriors and know that God's with them, and God was cleansing the land because God had promised them to their descendants, to these people now, I'm giving this to you, but now you've prepared, you also need to be in a place that these promises to assure you. And notice what happens in contrast to the Red Sea, and you jump down to verse 15, and as they bear the ark, we're coming to Jordan, that the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped into the brim of the water. For Jordan overflowed all of his banks all the time of the harvest. Fact is, verse 16, the waters came down from above. They stood and they rose up backwards. They heaped very far to the city of Adam, that is beside Zaratan. 
Those that came down towards the sea of the plain, even the salt sea failed, were cut off, and the people passed over right against Jericho. The priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on the dry ground in the midst of Jordan. All the Israelites were passed over on dry ground, and all the people were passed clean over Jordan. Amazing documentation of a historical event that happened somewhere just at the close of the 1400s, 1400 years for Jesus, and it's recorded so that these people in the day in which Paul's reading these stories and telling these stories is like, listen, this happened. And in contrast to Moses standing with the rod, he was forcing them to step out by faith and notice what triggered the blessing of God. They had to step out, and as soon as they touched that water, it moved up towards the city of Adam, somewhere between 15 to 30 miles, this massive heap. They're not walking on mushy, marshy water. It's on dry ground. These priests get to the middle, and he says, stay there. The ark is there. Two million people. How long did that take? How long would it take two million people to go through Phoenix at the, at the deal tonight? Well, I don't know if there's two million, but there is by technology. But it took them a while. And in the meantime, this is where they're seeing the power of God. Stand firm on dry ground. It tells me that God's putting these people in a place to be willing to step out in obedience because obedience always precedes understanding and it understands blessing. How many times your children, when you say, hey, son, I want you to do that, and they say, Why? You feel obligated to give them a why? Or do you say, you know what, because dad said so. Sometimes we want to understand something before we decide we're going to pull the trigger. This is a good illustration saying, hey, listen, you better step out. When that happens, then God begins to bless. The third stage, if you want to call a victorious Christian walk, is not just the preparation of promises, but I also jotted down thirdly that there is a place here in which I call them a pile of stones. This is the place in which this stack of stones right here become very, very important. And they piled up these memories. And during the midst of these in chapter 4, you end up finding that in verse 4, Joshua called the 12 men that prepared the children of Israel out of every tribe a man. And they picked up stones, verse 5, on their shoulders according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. There were 12 tribes. And he said, here's why I want you to do this, verse 6, that they may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in time come, he's saying, what means these stones that you can tell them, verse the end of verse 7, they're a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. God promised something. It's their rearview mirror of memory. And Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst, verse 9, of Jordan in the place where the feet of the priests had bare the ark. And once they left that, as soon as that happened, the flood, the, the waters came back together, and they went to a place called Gilgal, and this is where they placed these stones, verse 18. It came to pass when the priests that bear the ark of the Lord came up out of the midst of Jordan, and dry land, the waters of Jordan returned and flowed all the banks as they did before. What is it telling us? It's telling us for these people, they had a place to trust, but God also knew, I don't ever want you to forget this. You pick up a pile of stones, every, one big old monster rock for 12 men, strong men. They take it over and they encamp about four or five miles from Jericho, their first of 31 victories. And they built a big, Gilgal means round, that they build a round uh, put them in circle, but we do know they were stacked up. Why? So their kids would not forget what God did. It's a powerful, powerful story. God knows that we all have Teflon minds because nothing sticks. And God knows you need and I need those kind of things in order to help us. Fact is, you can go to the uh, Abraham Lincoln National Park and they have 12 stones and they represent 12 points in, in the life of Abraham Lincoln. 1620s or so, when the pilgrims showed up, there's a great book by Nathaniel Philbrick called Mayflower, documents 
all of the events of the pilgrims, when they got there within that year, they, they're meeting Squanto and the rest of the, many of those are Indians, and they were going down the same trails of many of these Indians, and they paused and they asked, what is this hole right here? And I've seen holes along our trails, your trails, and I'm walking. And the Indians said, those are our memory holes. Those are the holes that we dug at any place that a major battle or victory that we had, we never want to forget it. It really moved on the hearts of pilgrims. So what does that tell us? Let me give you in closing these three take-home truths. Number one, understand. If I could have you put it up because I don't have my notes as you have. Number one, daily remember to sanctify yourself before walking into your promised land of life. Every day, God, I need you in my life. I'm a child of God. I need to sanctify myself. In fact, there's a couple of verses here that might be of a help to you. One of those, if I could pull it up, is Psalm 118. The psalmist that wrote much of those events that happened said, How shall a man keep his way? By keeping heed to your word. This is why the first pastor at the church at Jerusalem made the statement in, in James, I believe. Can I, there you go. Therefore, ridding yourselves of all moral filth, the evil that's prevalent, humbly receive the implanted word which is able to save your souls. When you become a Christian, God positionally cleans up your life and takes care of the past. And now with his cleansing agent, the word, that every day, God, I want my conscience to be clear. I want my life to be clear. And then secondly, I would walk away and would suggest to you, you've got to daily remember that Christ isn't just a resident. He's the president. He's our inheritance and just as the children of Israel had the land of inheritance, Christ is our inheritance. Notice a couple of verses because I think it's important for you to remind her, and these would be good for you to compare, including Ephesians 1.18 at the end. He says, what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints? He is our inheritance. And it's not just that, but he says, I've given you the spirit of God. Jesus himself said it in John. He's the spirit of truth. He comes and he'll guide you into all of your life. Listen, every day you need to say, God, here's my day. Bring along uh, 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 the awareness and my, your presence in my life every day. I need the eyes of understanding. I need to be my, my, my spiritual lights turned on today so I can see the dark spots. And thirdly, and if you aren't used to doing this, I think a great John 16, 13. And then notice thirdly as I close, daily remember to not forget. You have to choose to not forget. This was the emphasis in a couple of different references. Let me give them to you. One of those would be in 1 Peter 1. It, actually, this should be 2 Peter 1 because this is what uh, uh, Peter said, I'm reminding you. I want to remind you. And he said it three times within 2 Peter 1, 12 through 14. That these things, I'm bringing into remembrance these things, that you would know them and be established, secure in the present truth. Stir up by way of remembrance. You have to choose. And actually, Psalm 78, also, the children of Israel were reminded to give uh, uh, um, the lessons that they learned to pass them on to the, your children. To the children of Israel, this is what they did. And to you and I, I would encourage you to be able to set up a pile of stones, a stack of stones. I know a family that uh, lived out west, had all kinds of stones, not grass, in, in the area of Arizona. And they, they put up, on this basis, they put an empty jar is every time we see God answer prayer, do something that's so amazing, I'm going to put this pebble in it. And eventually they had a pretty good stack right in the little jar. My wife and I years keep record of these are things that God's done because I'm going to tell you something. Our minds are negative. We move towards the possibility of what could happen, and therefore that resists us, and we pump the brakes spiritually on often what God says, you move forward by faith. You step out and say, is this what I'm supposed to be doing? Then I'm going to do this with courageous faith. 
I mentioned about this Jack Lucas and have the privilege to meet him. And I'm sitting there uh, with him in the passport office as we were getting ready to get on the plane. He and his wife, they were wonderful people. He was so energetic and so glad to be able to tell this story about him and the hand grenades and being in a foxhole and then surviving that and getting the Congressional Medal of Honor. And I thanked him. I said, Mr. Lucas, thank you for your service. Let me ask you a question, Mr. Lucas. Why did you do that? And I kid you not. He said, you know, the Bible says, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. That's what he told me. I reached in and I had a little gospel track from Harvest Baptist Church where I was the pastor in Guam. I said, you know, Mr. Lucas, you know who said that? Jesus said that. He gave his life for you and I. And if I admit that my sin has separated from me and God, and I believe that Jesus Christ came down to this earth to pay a penalty for my sin, God gave his love, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, then I can call upon the name of the Lord. I repent of my sin. I turn to you. I take you as my Savior then I cross over, in essence, out of a land of Egypt to a land, a promised land. And I trust and pray that if you've never taken Christ as your Savior, you just start there. And once you end up becoming a Christian now, what's keeping you from stepping out by faith with courageous faith in your life, in your family, in your church? Could it be that we, none of us have gone this way before? Absolutely. And sometimes we're so certain that God says, suspend your certainty just long enough that you'd know the possibility. God, thank you for your word and the truth of it. I pray that you would help us today from this simple story that was read to the believers back in Jesus' day. And that it becomes a picture for us that we as well need to have courageous faith. And even as so many that have given their life in physical battles, that we have a spiritual battle. Greater is he that is us than he that is in the world. It is all about Jesus and who you are. And ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.